Hey guys, Greg here, and let's solve permutation in string leak code number 567. So we're given two strings, S1 and S2, and we need to return true if S2 contains a permutation of S1, or of course, false otherwise. So in other words, return true if one of S1's permutations is a substring of S2. Sounds a little daunting, but you can really break this apart. So S1 is the one we're looking for permutations of, and S2 is the one where we're looking for those as a substring. If you have a substring in here that is either AB or its other permutation BA, then you can return true. Now we do see one of those in here. We can see a BA. This is a substring. And so we do return true. However, in this example, same thing, the permutations are A, B, and B, A. Over here, there is no substring that is A, B, or B, A. This is called a subsequence, but it's not a substring because you'd have to have the O in there. So it's not true. We would have to return false for this example. And it is extremely important for this example to know that S1 and S2 are only lowercase English letters. Now the brute force for this is kind of crazy because if you'd want to check if any of S2 substrings are a permutation of S1, well, you'd at least need to get all of the permutations of S1. And that's pretty easy when it's only two characters. It's just both ways around. It's A, B, and B, A. But in general, if we said that S1 had a length of N1, well, the number of permutations is actually computed as an N1 factorial. And that is basically an exponential here because if you had say 10 length, it would be 10 times 9 times 8 times 7 all the way down until times 1, which is a very high number. And that's only for a length of 10. It's already a very high number. So once you get into the bigger lengths, that is just, you know, not realistic. Uh, we'll cover in another video on how to actually compute the permutations. But for now, just know it's a factorial. Now we can actually do what's called a fixed size sliding window algorithm. And just to give a quick visualization, we'd look look at all of these windows here. Okay, all of the windows of length two. And the reason it's length two is because we're looking for a permutation of S1. Well, a permutation is the same size as S1. If this again was length N1, well, it's equal to two. So we're basically just going to slide this window to get all of the windows of size two, or in general of size N1, and then we can just check those we can compute the frequency array for this string here. And we can also do it for any substring of S2. We can get what we'll call, we'll just call it counts one. So this is going to count the letters and I'm giving it underscore one relating it to S1. So the counts one, well, that is going to simply be the array of all the indices of zero to 25 because we have 26 letters and we're going to mark in the A spot. So that's the beginning here. This is for A, this is for B all the way up until Z we'll mark that we have one A and we have one B. By the way, those should actually be lowercase, but whatever, I'm just gonna get rid of that. Okay, so the counts one would look like this, where we'd have one in the A spot, one in the B slot, and basically zero everywhere else. And this one's never gonna change because this array right here, that is always going to be the counts of S1. S1's not changing. However, for S2, we're going to look at substrings of length two. And you can see that the frequency of that is kind of constantly changing here. So at first we'll get counts two is just the same as we'd initialize counts one, two, which is a bunch of zeros. And then at the very beginning, we would actually start to build this up here. Okay, so by build it up, I mean, we want to first look at the first character here. So the first character, well, what is that? We'll just basically mark that in the E slot, we'd have a one there. I'm not going to fully draw that. It would be index zero, index one, and then there would be an index for E. And then we would build this up until we got to the length of the substring we're looking for. So then we would go and update our I position. Again, I'll just kind of say that in the I index, whatever number that represents, we'd have a one there. Okay, so now at this point, we basically have two frequency arrays. We have one for the characters of S1, and we have one for the characters of S2. And because it's kind of hard to draw this entire thing out. I'm actually just going to kind of mark it as a different format. I'm just going to say that we have in the E slot, we have one and in the I slot, we have one. But just know under the hood, this is actually an array of 26 numbers where you'd only have ones or twos or the frequency of whatever letter in those letter slots. And at this point, we can immediately say, hey, if these two things are actually equal to each other, and I know they look a little different because I'm writing them differently, but if they are actually the same thing, well, that would 
would actually mean that S2 substring, the one we're currently looking at, first one in this case, well, that would mean that it does contain a permutation of S1. Why would that be the case? Well, counts one here, that is just counting the characters of S1. That is going to be the same for all permutations of S1 because a permutation is just a different ordering, A, B, and B, A, but have the same frequency array because it's still counting the same characters. Okay, so if those two were equal to each other, we could actually immediately return true in that case. However, that is not the case. So let's move on here. So at the very beginning, they were not equal to each other, but then maybe we found one over here. So we'll slide this window across. And what does sliding this across do? Well, it fundamentally does two things. It means we lose the E, see that we lose what's on the left, and we added the D here. So we added the D and we lost the E. We need to do both of those things. However, many E's we had, well, we actually have one less of those. And in the D slot, I'm going to just kind of add it like this. And you could literally use a dictionary instead, which is kind of what I'm drawing here. But we'd have D, we would actually have one more of those. And then we'd again ask like, hey, now, are these things equal to each other now? Well, no, they're not. So we'd move on here. We slide our window across, we get a B, and we lose an I. So in the I slot, we would go down one, and we would actually gain a B. So we have one B and one D. Are these two the same? No, they are not. So we do this again. And at this point, we lose our D. That doesn't really sound like a good idea, but that's what we're doing. And we also gain an A. So we mark that we have our A. We have that these two arrays are actually equal to each other. And therefore, we could return true because it means that this substring we're currently looking at is a permutation of S1. It's this one right here. Okay, but imagine that wasn't the case here, like this was actually a C. It's going to be the wrong color, but that's fine. We would end up just kind of moving this across. We'd keep updating our array. And eventually when you got to the end here, then that is when we would eventually return false. But we know that we didn't end up doing that. Okay, so firstly, we'll get n1 is the length of s1, and we'll get n2 is the length of s2. Now, then we can initialize our counts. So we'll get the counts of s1 as s1 counts. That is equal to initially an array of 26 zeros, and s2 counts is going to be exactly the same thing, the list of 26 different zeros. Now quickly, a little sanity check here. If n1 is actually greater than n2, we can immediately return false. Why is that? Well, in s2, we're trying to find a permutation of s1, except if s1's bigger than s2, well, there's no way you're gonna find that. So we can just return false. That doesn't really change the big O complexity, but it does make it faster in some circumstances. Okay, now what we're gonna do is build up the counts of s1, and this is never gonna change. Once we get that, it's always going to be the same. So we'll do for i in the range of n1, we can go through and get the s1 counts at the ord of s1 at i minus the ord of a, which actually is just 97. So you can just replace that with 97. That is going to go up by one. And this fully stores the counts of S1. Why does it do that? Well, S1 at I, that is just the character that we're looking at. The ord of the character means get the ASCII value of that character. We are only dealing with lowercase English letters. So we're only dealing with lowercase a to lowercase z. The ASCII value of lowercase a itself is 97. So if we have an a, that's gonna be 97 minus 97, which is zero. And everything else like a b, a c, that's just gonna be off by one, off by two, and so on. So we're just adding up the frequency in that current spot. And what's very clever here is we can build up the initial window. So this is the thing that we're going to start sliding across. So we set S2 counts at the ord of S2 at I minus 97, okay? A very slight change here. So we're gonna go through the S2 string and we are going to update the S2 counts by its characters. Now S2 counts is going to change, but for now we're just building it up at the same time so that at this point we can immediately ask if s1 counts is actually equal to s2 counts that means that we have already found that substring and so we can return true at this point if that is not true then we need to move on and start sliding our window across 
Now to slide our window across, we need to go in this particular range. For i in the range of n1 up until n2, so why does this work? Well, we start inclusive at the index of n1. When we're going through here, we go up until n1 exclusive. So say that n1 was three. We need to do this three times, and that's what it will do. That will go through the indices of zero, one, and two. But then we need to keep this going, and so we start at the index of n1, that would be the index of three in that case, and then we need to go up until the length of n2 minus one. That is how we go over all of the valid indices, starting at the first indice we haven't seen yet. Now to add that new character into our frequency array, it's really the same thing. And so we can just get that ASCII value, we can put it into an index, and we can increase the S2 count. That is exactly the same. Now to lose a character, it's a little bit different. And let me just copy it in here so we can immediately see the difference. It is going to be that firstly, it's gonna be a minus equals one. So what this is saying, this is implying that the character we're losing is located at the index of I minus N1. Why is that true? Well, let's think about it. If we had, say, a window length of three, so we're looking for substrings of length three, that means that n1 is equal to three. If that was the case, well, then let's say we had the string of a, b, c, d. So those would be the indices of zero, one, two, and three. Well, then we'd build up our initial window as a, b, c. This is our initial window. When we slide this across, we actually go over to b, c, d. So our index i is going to be set at the D over here, it's going to be three. We lose the character at I minus N1. So I minus N1, that is three minus three, which is zero. We should of course, at the beginning, lose the first character because we slide it over by one. So that is why we update this index. And then again, we just get the character we're looking at, convert it to its ASCII value, and then we get that corresponding index to decrease their frequency by one. Okay, so let's get rid of that. And then all we really need to ask here is that every time we do this in the loop, we add our character, we lose our character. We need to say, hey, again, if S1 counts is ever equal to S2 counts, that means again, we can return true. If we get out of here, we have looked at all of the substrings and we can return false. Let me zoom out so you can see all of the code. And this is actually perfectly correct. Okay, now let's think very closely about the time complexity of this. Well, let's look at it. We get some lengths, that's gonna be constant. Comparison, constant. We get some arrays of 26 things. 26 is a big, but still constant number. So that's still constant here. We go through the length of N1. Okay, so it's at least big O of N1 because we do go through that. We do some checks in here. This is just constant work, so that's fine. We say this comparison. This is a very interesting one. So what is the complexity of this? That is basically saying go through both of these arrays at the same time. So you can think of kind of 52 operations there, 26 times two. And so this itself is a pretty long, but still constant operation. So that part is still O of one. Okay, then over here, we need to check for i in the range of n1 to n2. That itself, you can kind of ignore the starting point of n1, and you can just say that really, that is also a big O of n2. So we will say that we're also going through n2's length. And all of this stuff in here, that is also constant. This is definitely constant, and we have our same equality before, that's not gonna change. Okay, so currently our complexity is big O of n1 plus n2, and really you can just say that this is big O of n2 two or really big O of n. Because we have this check here, we say if n1 is ever bigger than n2, we're going to return false. So otherwise, we're only doing this stuff if n2 is at least or bigger than n1. So really, you can just talk about this in terms of n2. And so this is big O of n2. Okay, and the space complexity of this, well, this is going to be big O of 1. Can you believe that? Well, let's see it. We have some variables. That's constant. This is constant. We are storing some arrays which are length 26 but that's still a constant number so even though we're storing basically 52 values in these arrays combined that's still a constant thing and all of this stuff we're not really storing more we're just changing the values that are there so this is actually a constant space solution here's our final answer drop a like if this was helpful and have a great day guys bye, -bye.